Yeah, so um, this is uh, something in the line of uh, Unix philosophy. So, you know, do one thing and do it well, and little tools playing nicely with each other. Okay, so uh, there, there is nothing called a LaTeX pipeline uh, yet formalized. LaTeX has been around for, what, three decades now? Um, but yet, uh, in the modern era, we don't still have like an automated pipeline which plays very nicely with revision control systems. There are individual packages out there, certainly, but there is nothing like a unified like a, a pipeline. So I made something up uh, as part of my thesis writing process. I discovered something. I did not create any framework, certainly, but I used the existing frameworks and put them together in a pipeline. So I just wanted to show about that um, and how it works and how that can be potentially useful for you guys uh, if you're interested in picking up this or any variation thereof. I have one slide. In fact, I made about 15. But basically, the slide just introduces what we are going to talk about, building and collaborating on research documents using modern cloud technologies. Um, cloud is certainly the new fad, isn't it? Like Everybody wants to be on the cloud. You hear of Docker. You hear of Kubernetes and whatnot. Uh, but LaTeX is old school. When Don Nuth came up with tech, it was all like working on mainframes until it was ported onto PCs, um, probably in the mid 80s, early 90s, certainly. And LaTeX 2E, the version that's currently in use, has not substantially changed. There are certainly changes to the kernel, but hasn't substantially changed since 1994. Uh, but how can we leverage uh, existing, uh, for example, cloud technologies to build our LaTeX documents not on our desktop, but on the cloud? Now, when I say this, for a beginner in LaTeX, something like Overleaf would be the one that pops up, right? Have, People have heard of Overleaf here. And basically, it's like an online editor uh, and a building system. And they just use Docker underneath. Let me just log on to my, I have like a personal account, um, which lets you log in. And once you log in, you have all these projects where you can just build your document on the cloud. So it's all done and dusted, right? So we can go home. Actually, no. I, I think that while this is a great platform, and Overleaf is not the only one out there. There is LaTeX Base, there is Papyria, there is Authoria, there is a few other, uh, which I don't mention by name, but there are, there are quite a few other. And we should, in fact, be thankful to these guys who have developed this wonderful platform. And I use them quite quite often. But are they perfect? They're probably f not, not quite out there. One of the weakest components in this is, is the editor. For example, if I have an, um, let's say I have a project here, right? And all that I get is a bare bones editor. Now, I'm not saying that is not sufficient. It's probably OK for many people. It's probably OK for most people. Uh, but we can certainly do better, right? So that, But clearly, this is not their point. Their point is to give you a reproducible environment for building the documents in the cloud. So they part partially achieve their goal, but it's not a very pleasant writing experience. Yes, uh, certainly there is some form of editor control that you can choose. You can choose the engine that you want to do. You can choose whether you want Vim or Emacs, and that's pretty much it. Um, that's just from an editor point of view. I'm not going to harp on the editor's uh, thing, but just to show you how powerful editors can be, right? For example, if I, this is my thesis, uh, by the way. This is my full PhD thesis, which I wrote in uh, LaTeX. So if I open up my document, that's my main file. And now you can see how powerful editors can be. There is clearly syntax highlighting is the minimum thing that you can expect, uh, which I think overleaf editors do. But I'm sure that they cannot do, like, for example, linting on the fly or things like, um, things like this, which I'm going to show you now. Hyper-focused writing. So you write only in that paragraph which you're interested in, and everything else fades out of you. Things like that. These are editor features. I'm not going to harp about it because everyone has their favorite editors, right? Emacs people are there, Vim people are there. I'm not going to start a war again, OK? But right. So, but you can have like folding, things like folding. These are things which you expect, anyway, um, out of a text editor. So that's a section. It's a section in my um, introduction, introduction document, and it's called Working Principle of Batteries. I did a PhD on lithium-ion batteries, and this is my PhD thesis. The next section is talks about battery modeling, and now I can just expand that section, and then Think about how, how that might be um, done. And once I'm done with this, then basically I get out of that mode. Um, and things like formatting, for example, if I write stuff like this, and then I expect that my editor will be able to format stuff for me nicely. right? If I do stuff like that, my editor should be able to automatically wrap it at 80 characters. And now I see that it's not uniformly aligned. It's not right justified. Sure, no problem. I just do that. And my editor right justifies. I mean, justifies it for me. This may not be the best strategy, for example, with respect to version control systems. But here, that, that's just one thing that the text editor should be able to do for you. And things like autocomplete. You can even expect, you can even predict English text for me. For example, if I start writing something like that, it'll give me English text. So I have to type less because I'm a lazy person. And uh, Right, so the editor should be able to do all this. And clearly, Overleaf's editor or any uh, online systems editor is not up to there, up to the up to the mark yet. But that's something that we can get away with. But what is what is uh, something not that great about these online systems is that, for example, they are very poor at large scaling, large scale software. For example, these this cloud editor which I'm talking to you about. Um, cannot really scale well. For example, I have 1,048 commits in my PhD thesis. Right, uh, That's the number of commits I did in my Git history. So 
over the last six months, I have been writing and I submitted on October 2nd, um, right, or October 3rd, uh, but they got like 1,048 commits in the, in the, and now can Overleaf handle this? I, I, I tried, and it says there is an option to import from GitHub, and I tried importing from GitHub, it tries to connect online, and then let's see, uh, and the interface is not ready, but we can work with that, let me search for it using my browser, okay, there's a PhD thesis, import Overleaf, and we'll be staring at that computer screen for the next 15 minutes, it just can't do it yet. Or there is some bug and it has already done it, but it, the interface is not updating. All these kind of things. It's not a ding against Overleaf. It's just not meant for this kind of stuff. It's meant for stuff where you have a couple of hundred commits. And you can probably handle it. But an existing repo with thousands of commits, I, I found it to be, I found it hard, hard to be convinced with this kind of a system. Okay, so I'm sure we can now cancel that out. Okay, and now uh, there is some something else going on uh, with Overleaf, which made me. It's not against just Overleaf. It's all these systems. I'm just has more experience with Overleaf. I just have more experience with Overleaf, and that's why it's not a ding against these guys. It's not not a point against these guys. But there is something called as a timeout feature. It's like a fair use message, and I keep kept hitting this thing. So they say that there is like a fair use limit of four minutes. So I think Imperial College has like a pro account uh, where. Your document, you cannot go more than four minutes. Other online systems may have different limits. Now, you may think four minutes, that's already a lot. Why does, why does, why do you need four minutes? It's because I use this new, uh, I use some fancy packages. So once you add packages, right, later can become quite heavy and bloated. For example, there are packages which lets you uh, turn off ligatures selectively. There's a package called sell no lig, uh, which only works in Lua tech and not PDF later. PDF later is quite fast and stable and everything, but I use Lua tech because I wanted to have fancier fonts in my system. So later, with PDF later, you can only probably get only type one fonts and some kind of of, uh, basic font selection is only possible. But with Lua Tech, you can get uh, any font installed on your system and you can also install additional fonts if you want to. Now, the penalty with Lua Tech is Lua Tech is an order of magnitude slower than PDF LaTeX. Right, so I just hit these limits all the time. So the, for the first few months of my thesis writing, for the first, first one month or so, this was fine. My document was compiling under like four minutes. But later on, as you can probably see, uh, okay, I'm now going to port onto this website called Travis. Uh, which is like a continuous integration platform, which I want to discuss later uh, in detail. So this Travis continuous integration. Let's we can log on with our GitHub account. And if you inspect my PhD thesis, it says ran for 11 minutes and five seconds. So there's no way that Overleaf or any other system could have taken that much without timing out. So that's one thing. Um, there are various other advantages of running a, a system completely away from you in the cloud. Um, I, I, and I came to this thing, not just because of the timeout, maybe I could have worked with the timeout, maybe I could have gone back to PDF LaTeX, which is quite fast, but there was one thing which really triggered this. It was because my supervisor did not know LaTeX, but he, obviously, um, they did not want to edit it, they did not want to um, have anything to do with it, and all that, but they were happy with PDFs, so they were happy saying, give me a PDF, I'm going to give you my feedback on the PDF, I annotate it online, and I give it, send it back to you, or we can discuss over meeting. So he was happy with that workflow. Now, the problem with this online system says you have to compile them on the fly here, either manual or automatic. And he clearly didn't have patience to, to uh, run it for like 12 minutes. Now the question immediately that could arise is why don't you just send him an email, right? So I have to email him what, like 15 times in six months or 20 times, and we don't know which version we are talking about, right? So because I wanted continuous feedback from the, from the professor, and he was also happy to do that kind of a thing. Like he, was, he, he, didn't, he, did, he, he didn't insist on me completing like three chapters and giving him one email. He said, okay, if you've written like a couple of important sections, you can just give it to me and I'm going to check it for you. Now, Overleaf, you could make it a live link and have the supervisor do it for you, right? As in, he can compile, but clearly it's not a good idea to make a supervisor wait for like 10 minutes until Luatech compiles. So that was another motive for me to look for a more efficient system. And I wanted something which is reproducible. So in the initial rounds, for the first week or so, I found that if I make a typo, right, and I give a live link to my supervisor, in the future, I have probably fixed the typo myself. But when I go to the meeting with my supervisor, we work asynchronously, right? I work in the night, he works in the day, okay? So when we meet, when I meet with, the, when I meet with him, it's like, you have these typos. And then I'm like, ah, oh, I've already fixed it, right? So that's because he saw an older version, which I had emailed before, uh, or, I, or he downloaded straight away before I had a chance to fix. So I wanted something which was always live and which was always available and which was always, you know, having a version control stamping or, I wanted something which will show which version of the document he checked. And I can just go to him and say, oh, this has already been fixed in my version. And I can understand which version he was working on. If you don't have a version control stamping on your document in the footer or something, then you're in trouble. So maybe I can explain what I'm talking to you about just to give you the final picture. And then I work through the workflow which took me there. OK, so for example, uh, if you look at this, this 592 versions of the PDF are all PDF versions which have been version controlled excessively. For example, if you look at the timestamp here, um, 3rd of October, that's when I submitted the document. Mm, let's say, look at the morning, 7 o'clock version. Okay, and that's my PhD thesis that you're seeing right there. Now, the most interesting thing is the footer. 
it says 7C45513. So during the time I work with my supervisor to get feedbacks uh, of the drafts, this was immensely useful to know which version of the document you guys are working on. And this is, I'm assuming this would be super helpful when you're collaborating with a collaborator and they're also using a revision control system like Git, right? So you can know exactly which version of the document you're uh, working on. And more than that, it actually matches the name of the file. And this is all automatic. I, I wish that Travis had a, for, instead of a 40 character SHA, they had an opportunity to give you a six character SHA, but I'll take this, right? I'll take this any, rather than saying main version one dot PDF, main version two dot PDF. No, it's, the file name is exactly matches what, what we have, okay? Right? So the next one is main whatever. Um, the next document would be 192. And this happens on every page. So the footer is in every page. And it can be customized quite heavily. Okay, so there are these two aspects. The Git version control stamping on the document itself and the uh, collaboration with a live um, building on the cloud environment. So I'm going to show you these. I know that we are pressed for time. Jeremy, just let me know when, and then I'll hurry. Yeah. Uh, but that's the final product. We're going to see how to build up to that product. Okay. Um, so I made a sample repository. Clearly, we, working on for 11 minutes building on the cloud is not the most efficient use of the time. So I made a sample uh, document. I think it's uh, C. Yeah. Okay. So this is just a simple uh, LaTeX project. Okay. It's got um, basically my favorite fonts, which is right now Libertinus, which means you have to use an uh, engine like Lua LaTeX or, P or Z LaTeX rather than PDF LaTeX. Um, we'll talk about hooks. Hooks are very interesting. These are Git hooks. Um, there's some color profiles because Imperial College requires that uh, your document that you submit, uh, your PDF document must be PDF A or PDF X. So we're going to uh, do that. And that's my preamble. It's all these packages I used. The most interesting one for us in this talk will be Git Info or Git Info 2, which is like an improved version of Git Info made by the author. And that's my main file, main.tech. Okay. Um, right. So, um, Let's examine main.tech. It's got a preamble, a document, and basically a couple of chapters. Okay, so I got like um, uh, what introduction and literature review. These are the two chapters that we are going to be building on the cloud, and it basically it's just got lorem ipsum text, blind text. Okay, so how do we build this on the cloud? As in the service that we are going to be using to build this on the cloud is called Travis. Travis is a ver version control system. But before we even go there, we need to have a version control in the first place, which means you need to, I, I, I prefer to use Git. Git is my favorite version control system. It's a distributed version control system. So you can work anywhere, work offline, and then you can commit whenever you're ready. And so I'm going to initiate a repository, git init. So initialize an empty repository. Now, if I look at git status, well, there's a bunch of files to be committed. I'm going to add all of them by using git add dot. All right, it takes a while. Okay, and that's done. Now git status tells me that there's all these files to be added and I'm going to git commit them and I'm going to say initial commit. Okay, so we have a repository uh, now. Git status should now come back clean, okay? Now, this is not a git class, so I'm not going to go through the workflow explaining in detail again. Uh, I'm going to show how now by connecting the uh, by connecting a remote like GitHub, we could uh, efficiently use the um, online service called Travis that I just showed. So I'm going to create a new repository online, and GitHub for students or for educational establishments gives you private repositories. So I'm going to say demo continuous integration LaTeX, okay, and I'm going to make it a private repository. And that's the advantage, right? Like we're all doing open science, but we don't want the science to be published until it's ready and in its polished form so that the reader can understand what we're talking about, right? We may have all sort of gibberish until then uh, in the document, in the working manuscript, in the wo working draft. So we need the document currently to be private and Travis works with that. Now, typically you would initialize with the readme, but I am going to show how the readme can be used for indicating the build status of the document. If the build fails or build passes, we will know. Uh, basically, I'm going to explain what this means. So if you look at the build history here, of my PhD thesis, you can see some of them are red. That means that I made a LaTeX error, and Travis is going to warn me about it, and I can just use that, uh, um, and I can flag that status in my in my uh, Markdown file uh, as a readme document. So I'm going to show that next. So I'm going to create a repository. Okay, it's just the standard stuff so far. Uh, we're not uh, we, we have an existing repository, so I'm going to basically add remote origin. I already have my SSH key set up, so I'm going to use the SSH version of the document. All right, so I pushed it online. So far, it's not connected to Travis or any other continuous integration systems. Now, this is the minimum that anybody should be using for your writing your LaTeX document. This is a bare bones system that I've just done. Work on your documents as plain text files, edit it in your editor or overly for wherever, connect it to some kind of GitHub repository, okay? If you don't do that, then uh, probably that's not the most efficient thing, uh, right? Okay, now, um, where are we, okay? Right, uh, so we are in this. So if I refresh this document, okay, there is one commit, okay? And that one commit is just a normal commit, and now you would keep editing your document forever until things work uh, and your PhD thesis is finished. This is just a bare bones thing. 
Okay, now comes the interesting part, how to connect this to Travis. So Travis is a continuous integration system and it uses this configuration file called uh, Travis.yaml. It's a YAML file yet in the markup language file. And this file can um, basically talk to talk to GitHub um, directly. So each time you push, or each time your collaborator pushes to GitHub a new branch or something, or even to the existing branch, it'll make a build. It'll run LaTeX on top of the document. You have to set it up. So I'm going to show how that can be done. So let's just see. Okay, so you got all this uh, stuff. What is the next thing that you got to do? Travis, you got to initiate Travis on this repository. So Travis comes up with a command line tool called Travis. This is a Ruby file. Okay, and that's why the abstract of the document said how we can leverage existing tools from various ecosystems. So uh, Travis is a Ruby gem. So basically, you would uh, to install Travis, you would say gem install Travis. So gem is a package management package management framework for Ruby files. Um, it is provided by the Travis uh, team. Uh, so you, I have already installed it. So I have Travis available on my path. Okay, so that, that's where the Travis executable is. So now you've got to make Travis aware about aware about this repository. How do you do that? Unfortunately, I'm using Windows. I'm logged into Windows, and I don't um, have the right speed because I'm, I'm using a Chigwin um, POSIX emulation layer. So clearly, I don't have um, the right uh, speed to, do, to show you this right now. But what I'm going to do is simulate an environment where I'm on another computer, and uh, I clone this repository to another machine. So let's just say I clone this. So this is my work machine, machine which is sitting at my work desk. And I clone into that um, repository all these files. So if I go into demo. CI, LaTeX, all the files are available, right? This is like a basic thing you would do. You would work from uh, like your workstation at work, go home, use your laptop, clone it, pull it, push it, all this kind of stuff. Use GitHub as like a remote um, central place for you to work with. But we're going to do something more. What we're going to do is we're going to do uh, something like Travis login dash dash pro. Travis uses the same GitHub um, login credentials. So when you use Travis login pro, you're going to be asked your username and password. And that's your GitHub username and password. So you just basically put that, right? So you basically put your GitHub username and password, and it should say successfully logged in. So Travis gives you a command line interface for you to log in online. Okay. Now you can just use Travis um, to to work with your software. Okay. So now Travis is initiated on this file. Uh, now let me show you how this can be uh, made to work with. So next you go to TravisCI.com and look at the dashboard. Basically, the dashboard says, oh, there's a couple of other projects connected. They are open source projects, and there's one closed source project, which is my PhD thesis. But the project that we just started in GitHub is not yet connected to Travis. Five minutes? Yeah, OK, right. So I'm going to speed up here. So you go to Settings, and go and say Manage Repositories on GitHub, and use only selected repositories, and then say Demo CI LaTeX, OK? And then you approve the Travis connection. Now the Travis says, OK, right. It's now connected to that repository. That means that in addition to building my document locally, I can also build it in the cloud. Now, I don't think we have time for talking about the GitHub uh, connection, uh, the, the Dropbox connection, but that could be um, done maybe separately. So Travis uses an YAML file for doing this. The advantage of this is, OK, they don't have a, a LaTeX-specific uh, version of connecting your software, but if you have written your code in Python or Ruby or any of the standard C, C++, any of these languages, then it would understand that. And it can run some specific test tools for you. Uh, it's also a testing framework, um, right? So you could uh, have Git master, master branch. You could have other branches. And you can connect, um, and you can build any of these branches. And this is an interesting thing. So if you made some very complex document, uh, you could have it notify you by email. So if your document failed, you could just get an email saying, hey, your document failed. If your document is success, it will typically also give you the email saying your document was building, your building was success. Uh, but I set it to, I hope to have more successful builds than failure builds. So I, I set my on success to never. And you got to, and there's no TechLive installed in, uh, so TechLive is a canonical latent distribution. There's MidTech for Windows, but it's Windows specific. But TechLive is cross-platform, Windows, Mac, Linux. So I use TechLive, and it's also built by a great team. Uh, uh, some of them are based here in the UK. But you can cache these directories. So you don't have to install TechLive each time. For the first time, you will have to. And here you give the later command that you would run later on. So you could run PDF LaTeX, you could run Lua LaTeX, you could run Z LaTeX, you could run whatever. And then uh, there is an install script. Because tech, the whole TechLive install is like what? Four gigabytes? That's a lot. Instead, I have my own customized version of GitHub. And I'll show what, that, what I mean by that. Uh, basically, I have like a very tiny GitHub, a uh, very tiny uh, LaTeX. So this is the infrastructure that the LaTeX build team uh, uses. Um, and then I install some packages on top of it. These are just the LaTeX packages that I prefer in my environment. Uh, there are about 300, what, 200 packages. The whole full LaTeX distribution is 3,000, 4,000 packages. And you don't need all of them. So I use something called as a scheme minimal. And that you can see, see in my profile, not scheme minimal. I think it's um, scheme tech live dot profile. It's um, scheme basic. 
the scheme basic, scheme full, scheme minimal, and scheme custom. But to automate it, you need to have like some kind of a basic scheme on top of which I, I run all these custom packages. And these will be installed only once. So it's a one-time fee you got to pay for the first time. And then since then, it will cache the repository. So I know that the setup was slightly complicated, but let's see if this will work. So I'm going to say main dot later. And like the presentation, uh, uh, jinx that can happen. This can potentially happen. Things may not work, but I'm nevertheless going to try. Okay. So I'm going to say maybe connected to Travis. And that's a change I just made there. I write the file. I ask for the status, and I say this main's been modified. And I say uh, looks like we may be connected to Travis build system. I have a spell check on. That's why Travis is not detected. And then I push. Right now, this should automatically kick off if things went well, and it, they don't typically go well uh, for the first time at least. So if if it went well, okay, there are two commits. Yeah, you can see there is a build status. That means that Travis is now trying to build my document. Okay, let's see where it does that. So I go to travisci.com again. Okay, and this shows my repository. It says running one, and let me see what am I running. I am running, okay, there's no language set because Travis understands only a subset of all the languages out there. Latex is not one that it understands, but we can have any custom script run on Travis. It essentially gives you a Linux environment for free. Like uh, all the shell utilities, the core utilities, the bin utilities, the fine utilities, all of them are available for free on, on, the, on Travis. I know certain universities, and I don't want to name them, in the Midlands, which doesn't allow you to install software. And that's a little bit of a hamstringing for me. And I prefer to, if they don't give it to me, I just make it run in the cloud, right? I mean, all the utilities are now available for you in the cloud. Look, that's where it installed the tech live. It's installing tech live and it runs the tech hash. Uh, right, and it's trying to run my code. There are 87 packages um, in the basic tech life scheme. We will wait for this build system to either succeed or fail, and then I think we have to stop. There is probably not enough time to show the Dropbox integration, but that'll be also pretty cool if, if at some point in the future I could show. Uh, so what are the advantages of this in addition to all this automation that I show? TechLive only releases binaries once in a year. So TechLive 2018, TechLive 2019, there's nothing in between. Well, but the Lua Tech team do release binaries. It's just not packaged by TechLive. So you could actually hack up a script where the next version of TechLive can be used to build, the version in development can be used to build your document. Is there an advantage to doing that? Currently there is, because Lua 5.3 just got embedded into, later, into Lua Tech. Lua 5.2 versus Lua 5.3, there is apparently a speed increase. So for my PhD thesis, before I built the document using uh, the released version of TechLive, now I'm building using the development version of TechLive. Look at that, 1.09. So you could have your own binaries replacing the TechLive installed binaries. And you could possibly get a speed increase. I know this is all like a bit of a, a rush. Um, a sp a speed. The speed is probably just a bit too much uh, to do this. Right. These are the 123 additional packages that it installed for me. Uh, and it's now loading the font. Uh, the font database have to be generated. This is done by Lua OTF load, which is Lua text way of doing uh, font installation. And you can see, OK, I have some blind text, uh, right? It says there's no bibliography file. It's basically running LaTeX in the cloud. And at some point, it should, and you can follow the log by just clicking follow log. And it says, okay, changes detected packaging new arch archive, right? And the command LaTeX MK, LaTeX MK is LaTeX automation software. It's like make, but for LaTeX, made for LaTeX. It's built by this person called John Collins, who is at Pennsylvania State University. It's like a LaTeX build automation system, uh, right? And it says the build has succeeded. Now you can see, now he, earlier it said some checks haven't completed yet. Now if you refresh this page, it says, yay, all checks have passed, right? And then your document uh, status online can be updated and it says there's a green. Now if you refresh this further, you could have this build status copied as a markdown thing. You can copy this markdown and then just go back into your editor and vi and make a readme.md file, okay, where you paste the markdown contents if it will allow me to, right? And then I can say um, with a header, PhD thesis build. This is my markdown file for the document, okay? And now git status, git add, come on, git come in. So this is, these are called badges. Added Travis badge to GitHub and Git push, right? And that should trigger another build. So your friend could be collaborating with you, and he could be building, and you could be building, and both of you could have the documents collaborating in this particular way um, online. In addition to just having the source code in LaTeX, you could also have the PDFs moved over to, to drop through a Dropbox command line interface through Dropbox. But I, I think, Jeremy, we are out of time, aren't we? Right. So today, I think we are out of time. But you could see how the build passing status shows up here. Um, I think I copied it twice, and that's why the second one is wrong. Right, so I think I copied the build status twice. This is a copy. Um, when I pasted it, it got pasted twice. So, right, so you could have a build status as passing or failing or passing or failing, and that's that's helpful. But more helpful is the Dropbox integration, uh, which if people are interested, you could just come to me. I'm, I intend to write a short blog or an article. Uh, I found some of this online in another blog, but I intend to also write this up in an article and post it for people who might be interested in this kind of workflow. Okay, that's it.
Uh, am I uh, like like later on, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yes, so GitHub is free for students, and you get like an entire education pack. 